Welcome to the Advanced Systems Integration Laboratory, or ASIL, virtual tour. We'll be exploring the ASIL anechoic chamber, the electronic combat stimulation labs, including the electro optics infrared lab, the threat air defense lab, and the radar lab, the surface aviation interoperability lab. Along the way, we'll hear from NOC AD experts and members of the Engineer Scientist Development Program. My name is Kurt Seebacher. I'm the Division Head of the Integrated Combat Environments Division. The ASOL is located at Naval Air Warfare Center, Aircraft Division, Patuxent River, Maryland. The ASOL is a very large anechoic chamber that is fully anechoic and allows an RF requirement test environment. The ASOL is part of a large installed systems test facility that allows us to test DOD assets around the nation. These assets have systems such as radars, electronic warfare, EOIR, data links, and other advanced electronic systems. The ASOL is also part of the Navy's overall electromagnetic environmental effects test facility. So let's go inside and explore the ASOL. The word anechoic means echo-free. An anechoic chamber is a facility that is built to absorb either sound or electromagnetic waves. The chamber measures 180 feet long by 180 feet wide and it has a height of 60 feet. This facility can accommodate aircraft as big as the E-6, the Boeing 707, and 737. Two 40-ton hoists are used to lift aircraft and other test items. The facility incorporates nearly 2.5 acres of anechoic material. The anechoic material reduces the electromagnetic field reflections, thus allowing the test article to replicate operating in a free field condition. The size of the anechoic material determines which frequency ranges are absorbed. The taller the anechoic material, the lower the frequency that is absorbed. This material consists of a waterproof urethane foam loaded with conductive black carbon and cut into square pyramids with dimensions set specific to the wavelength of interest. Pyramidal RAM attenuates signals by scattering and absorption. The pyramid shapes are cut at angles that maximize the number of bounces a wave makes within the structure. With each bounce, the wave loses energy to the foam material and thus exits with lower signal strength. Now, we're going to take a look at some of the features within the anechoic chamber. The Operations Control Center provides an area where tests can be controlled and viewed as is accessible to networks, stimulators, and simulator displays, and other observation cameras. All the entry doors into the facility have multiple rows of pneumatic bladders that push the doors into EMI finger stock and gaskets in order to maintain the integrity of the shield. The chamber has a pit area under the working volume that is inside the shield that houses support equipment needed to make the systems under test fully functional. This includes power, cooling, hydraulics, chillers, and other systems. The preparation area between the chamber door and the weather door is used as an additional test area and an area to perform the necessary tasks to get the aircraft ready for anechoic chamber testing. Now that we've seen the ASIL, we're going to explore the stimulators and labs with the Electronic Combat Stimulation, or EC-STEM branch, that are used to test items in the chamber. The EC-STEM branch has seven labs. Each lab can work independently or as a joined lab to support install systems testing or avionics systems for the Department of Defense. One of them is the Electro-Optics Infrared or EYR lab. That lab supports program efforts from field testing of collecting data from missile from test ranges, also developing algorithms for missile warning sensors and evaluating them. They also do the software development as well as the algorithm and hardware development for a radar scene generator. That system is key for many of the EOIR programs within the command because it allows us to be able to simulate missile flyouts to our fleet assets and allows the programs to be able to analyze the missile warning algorithms for countermeasure dispenses. It's a very important lab for the command because it allows us to augment the use of flight tests and data analysis to be able to allow programs to make key decisions as they move down their acquisition programs and schedules for milestones. 
Another key lab within the branch is the Threat Air Defense Lab. That lab focuses on closed loop radar stimulations and that lab can support a system under test within its facility or within the anticorp chamber that you have heard about already. I graduated from the University of Puerto Rico of Mayaguez. I have a bachelor degree in electrical engineer. Uh, right now I'm working with uh, Threat Air Defense Lab in the E-System branch. I work with simulators. I work with validation reports. As a ESDP, you can create your own career path. You can choose if you want to work with a PMA or if you want to work in a lab environment. You will have mentors. They will help you to build your career here. My name is Andre Miles. I'm an electrical engineer here at NOC AD at Patuxent River. I went to college at Morgan State University, which is in Baltimore City, and I got a bachelor's of science degree in electrical engineering. I currently work in the CNI lab, the Communications Navigation and Identification Laboratory, and EC STEM. So I think the coolest thing about my job is working here at the ACTEF facility, which is the anechoic chamber facility. So being able to bring our antennas and our equipment in the chamber and to be able to create a link with the pilot and the aircraft and his communication systems in the cockpit is an amazing thing. The EOIR lab, what you see from there, is a combination of physics, computer scientists, and electrical engineers utilizing data that they collect out at live fire test events at missile test ranges across the country. They are part of that evaluation of data collection. They bring that data back home here to Pax River. They evaluate it and then they actually create the scripts and the algorithms that you're seeing in this radar scene generator display for them to be able to determine how well an algorithm on a missile warning system is developed for us to be able to put that on a helo platform for potential use of the fleet. Another major piece is the multi-jammer characterization system, also known as the magic wall. This is a perfect example of how we take creativity from engineers and scientists that work within the branch and the use of actual equipment out in the real world. If you notice the magic wall, it's a five separate independent payloads that have radio frequency antennas on them for transmit, receive, or transmit and receive. The technology that we use was converted from actual on the field cameras that you see at professional soccer games and NFL games. The cameras that typically point down on the field, that technology was transferred into being at the intercord chamber and now we have a payload with an antenna that points out towards the system under test, which is actually be an aircraft or it could be a missile pod or it could be a communications vehicle. That platform allows us to be able to create dynamic RF scenes to systems under test for us to be able to evaluate the mission systems platforms. The key for EC STEM branch is that we create an RF environment for platforms to allow them to be able to operate their systems without flying but we trick the system to think that it's flying and to believe that it's located anywhere in the world that we tell it and to believe that whatever sensor response is it receiving, that they are real and that the systems respond to it appropriately. Went to West Virginia University and got two degrees in computer science and electrical engineering. In my work for the Radar Lab, I've been here a little over four years. Since I started here, I've worked on numerous development programs and test events. One of those is the ACE Airborne Early Warning Interoperability Stimulator. That piece of gear is specifically made to test the E2D, Mandate's APY9 radar system. So as an ESDP, I've assisted in the development, so making decisions to how the system will operate and in what format that will be in. I helped pick out the test equipment that would be used to calibrate that system. It's a very sensitive system, so high quality test gear was needed in order to fully automate the test setup and allow it to be a minimal effort for the engineers involved. The calibration now as it's automated, it only takes a few hours. With the test equipment that was originally picked out, it would have probably taken days to fully calibrate the system. So knowing that I was able to help solve a complex problem and save the Navy days of time in order to calibrate that system was fantastic. Next up, we're visiting the Surface Aviation Interoperability Lab. Hello, I'm Jeff Turner, the Chief Engineer of the Surface Aviation Interoperability Lab. Its sales mission is to emulate a ship so the aircraft in the Pax River area can link with, test with, and make sure they're interoperable with before they get out to the fleet. To accomplish this, SAIL has the communications and combat systems of multiple ships in the U.S. Navy. An aircraft carrier, an Aegis destroyer, and a littoral combat ship. And all the personnel with the experience to operate and maintain those systems. 
The sale was established in 2003. The mast on top of the building is uh, from the USS Arthur W. Radford DD-968, which was launched in 1975. We used the mast as it was originally designed to install our communications and radar antennas on top so they have a nice line of sight for the airspace out in the Atlantic test range. Besides linking by over-the-air means, the sail has connections through Ethernet wire and RF over fiber. The sail has all the tactical data links currently fielded in the U.S. Navy and operators specifically trained to conduct interoperability testing to ensure tactical data is exchanged correctly between aircraft and ships. The sail also has all the common data link or CDL systems fielded in the U.S. Navy, which are used by aircraft to send sensor data information point to point down to ships. The sail has the most prevalent version of aircraft carrier combat system called Ship Self-Defense System, including anti-submarine warfare and intelligence information processing systems. The sail also has two versions of Aegis combat systems, an older variant still active in the fleet and the newest variant currently being fielded in Navy destroyers. Using an Ethernet network or RF over fiber optic connection, the sail is able to link with an aircraft in the ASOL's large and small chambers to conduct extensive interoperability testing using the actual aircraft and shipboard systems running the exact software versions found in the fleet. Interoperability testing of this sort is invaluable to validate the proper exchange of tactical and sensor data. When problems are discovered, they are documented for software developers to correct the issue and then retested to ensure proper operation. Now that we've visited some of the labs within ASOL, we're going to hear from Jeff Miller about how these groups coordinate to execute test events. Hi, I'm Jeff Miller, the Airborne Electronic Attack Test Lead for the Integrated Combat Environment Division. As a test lead, I'm responsible for coordinating all aspects of test execution within our facilities. That all starts by interfacing with the test squadron and the associated PMA to define what needs to be tested and what data needs to be collected. Once we know what system needs to be tested, we need to look at the feasibility of operating that system inside our chamber. Do we need to hoist it? Do we have the correct power? Does it require special cooling? Are there any unique interfaces? In the case of the next generation jammer, it required a facility modification. A new power and cooling system needed to be integrated so that the pod could operate with inside the chamber. As you can imagine, facility modifications can take a long time. This particular effort for NGJ was years in the works prior to the first data point being collected. The next step in the process is determining what labs are needed to properly stimulate the SUT. We want to make that system under test think that it's operating as it would in the real world, when in reality, it's hanging stationary in our chamber. So at a minimum, we need to stimulate the navigation system. This could simply be us radiating a dynamic GPS signal into the chamber, or a more complex setup is us injecting navigation data directly into the system. With the navigation piece figured out, we then need to sync that up with any other stimulators our labs are providing so that we provide a coherent picture to the system under test. Once the groundwork is laying flat and you're at the test execution phase, coordination amongst all the test team members is crucial. Schedule in the chamber is tight and we need to be as efficient as possible. The aircraft test team, the EC STEM labs, and the facility personnel all need to work together to ensure we get set up as quickly as possible and start collecting data. With ever-changing requirements and advancements in technology, the ASOL group continually invests in updated testing facilities to remain as modern as possible. Chief Engineer Sam Niebauer will tell us more. Hello, my name is Sam Niebauer. I'm the Chief Engineer for the Integrated Combat Environments Division. One of my primary roles here is to work with our customers and our labs to identify gaps between their needs and our capabilities. In order for our facilities to stay on the cutting edge, we have to keep pace with advancing technologies. Once we understand the gap in our capabilities, we propose solutions and try and get investment funding. This funding can come from direct programs, investment improvement and modernization funding, or even from joint funding through the Central Test and Evaluation Improvement Program. Once we've secured funding, a project director is assigned the project director will set system requirements, work with vendors, complete design reviews, test the system, integrate it into our facility, and ultimately evaluate its effectiveness. At any given time, we have multiple projects executing at various stages in our projects. An example of a CTIP project that recently completed here is the Vertical Electromagnetic Pulse Simulator. This multi-million dollar project started in 2013 and took approximately five years to complete. 
This was a joint project with the Army and the Navy and delivered capabilities to both Army and Navy facilities. The Legacy Vertical EMP Simulator was only capable of testing test articles up to the size of about an F-18. There was a need identified by a Congressional EMP Commission to test systems up to the size of a Boeing 747 aircraft. That capability did not exist in the DoD. This need drove the requirement to build a much larger simulator. Industry partnered with the services to build the VEMP simulator co-located with the horizontal dipole EMP simulator at Pax River Naval Air Station. Projects like this are vital to maintaining the conditions of our facilities and advancing the capabilities of our Navy. The complexity and the ever-changing nature of the ASO enables employees to continue their education and enhance their skill sets through on-site work. We're going to hear from some of the members of the Engineering Scientist Development Program about their experience working at the ASOL. I attended North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University where I earned my Bachelor's of Science degree in Computer Engineering. Today, I am an Electromagnetic Compatibility Test Lead for the C-130s. As an EMC Test Lead for the C-130s, I work with Squadron VX-20 and PMA-207 to test the newly installed systems on the C-130s to ensure that they are compatible with the legacy systems and with the electromagnetic external environment. Due to the complexity of the system and the restrictions placed on it by the FAA and FCC, we were not able to test the system on land. Therefore, we had to do it during flight. This was exciting and new to me because it was my first time doing this AMC flight test and I'm the only one in my branch who was able to do so. Hi, my name is Reginald Farmer II. I currently work for EMC as the lead test engineer. I got into robotics at a very young age, which motivated me to pursue the engineering degree that I achieved at North Carolina a and An EMC lead test engineer is someone who takes on a platform, and from there you are basically putting your platform through different tests. Uh, so we have NERF, we have EMP, we have lightning, uh, we have electromagnetic capability, which is EMC and we basically put those aircraft through different tests to make sure that they're capable of being provided for the fleet and speed ready for the fleet. We asked the ASIL ESDP interns for their best advice for someone interested in pursuing a career in engineering. So first be prepared. Um, engineer is not an easy career. It's very tough but if you want to change the world, if you want to work with fighters, if you want to work with chips, with everything, engineer is like the best. Number one, to network because you never know where meeting new people and working with them can get you. And number two, don't be afraid to branch out in different areas and experience different activities and different job roles that you wouldn't expect to do. And once you get here to NAVAIR, communicating, reaching out to those that are already in positions that you want to get to, as well as networking, has been a great success for me and something that I would encourage anybody to do. I'm Ellen Trevetnik, the NOC AD Strategic Education Office Team Lead. We hope you enjoyed this video. Throughout this virtual tour, you heard from participants in the Engineer and Scientist Development Program, or ESDP. To learn more about the Engineer and Scientist Development Program, please visit our website shown on the screen, or you're welcome to submit your resume using the link below. Thank you.